my pleasure to introduce Mike Jordan as the invited speaker for the 2018 Tasker Memorial Lecture. This memorial lecture recognizes the late Ben Tasker, who made, who was an exceptional machine learning researcher, colleague, and friend. Ben made contributions in many aspects of the field, including probabilistic modeling, computer vision, and natural language processing. Today, we also celebrate the Tasker Center for Accessible Technology that's led by Anat Caspi. Uh, one of the focuses of this center is on the translation and deployment of open source technology um, to improve the lives of people with various abilities or disabilities. Um, on the academic side, this center focuses on the integration of um, universal design principles into the engineering curriculum. And as an example of something that the center has done, um, they've created something called access maps that are really popular ways of um, automating pedestrian routing based on people's abilities. I also want to acknowledge Ben's family who's come here today from the Bay Area. So it's exciting to have Mike giving today's lecture. Uh, Mike was Ben's postdoc advisor at Berkeley, and Mike is one of the most distinguished researchers in machine learning and statistics. Mike's won tons of awards that I won't attempt to list, but these include being inducted into the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And today, Mike is gonna be talking on aspects of optimization, um, which have connections to some of the work that Ben did with Mike on structured predictions. Thank you very kindly. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here. I've been in this room several times and I love coming here. It's such an amazing crowd and you're all so big. And um, Thanks to Emily, uh, I, she was really a postdoc with me. She was a, came uh, unofficially, but she'd come from MIT to visit us in Berkeley and did some really great work that helped uh, spur the field uh, uh, forward. So I wanna thank, uh, obviously, Anat and, and family for inviting me, but I, uh, there's really a deeper thanks I wanna give to them which is thank you so much for doing all the activities you've done uh, in honor of Ben and keeping him with us because we miss him. Um, and the fact that you have the center, that you have this event, gives us a place and, 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 um, and, a, and a grounding that we can come back to and, and remember Ben and, and you know, feel like he is still with us. Um, so I wanna thank you profoundly um, that you didn't do just something for your family, but you did something for really for all of us. So I really appreciate that. Um, uh, so if you get to my age in life, you've lost many people. Um, and so in fact, my parents are gone and, uh, and some great friends like Ben are gone. Um, and you get used to that feeling. It's not a great feeling, but it is part of life. Um, but I particularly notice it when I, you know, something happens that I wanna tell somebody about. Um, so with my, with my mother, it's like if something happens with my children, I wanna tell somebody and I think, oh, my mom's not there, that's too bad. Um, well, with Ben, he was probably the number one person when there was an academic idea that either I'd thought of or someone else had thought of, I wanted to tell Ben. Um, and so, in fact, this talk is really for Ben. This is material that uh, I've been working on for the last few years that I would want to tell Ben about. And, and so, in my own mind, I'll be giving the talk to him. It's somewhat technical, um, and I normally don't give quite as technical a talk, but it's kind of mathy. But that's, that's the, the kind of things that Ben and I would talk about. We both love math and we both, the beauty of it and, and, the, and the fun of it. Um, so I, I certainly remember being around Ben and having this uh, little playfulness, of, you know, twinkle in the eyes, a uh, little smile kind of always on the face uh, when we talk about math. And it was sort of, he, he understood the playfulness of being an academic and, and the beauty of that and the fun of it um, and, and the humor associated with it. Um, so, um, so anyway, I wanna thank all of you for bringing me here to, to, to participate uh, in this uh, really celebration of all, all of us, uh, but particularly Ben. Um, so in fact, Ben taught me a lot about optimization. And so optimization is the theme of this talk. A lot of people are talking about AI these days and machine learning. Um, frankly, I don't think we're there yet. I don't think those fields have yet to do anything really that serious. Uh, so it's amazing how much hype we have now about it. Um, most of the ideas have been discovered in statistics, op optimization, operations research, areas of computer science. Um, economics and so on, and machine learning is basically an integrative discipline that brings these ideas together to, to solve the problems. Ben really created a whole lot of new ones, per se, frankly. Um, and the fact that it's being rebranded now as AI as if we've solved the big problem of intelligence, which we haven't even begun to solve. 
uh, maybe in my lifetime we'll start to perceive it, but we're not perceiving it yet. And so that the fact that we're talking in this kind of uh, exalted language is, is alarming to me. Um, and so I, as the kind of wave is pushed in that direction of all the hype and all the anxiety, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've headed in exactly the opposite direction, which I typically do in my career. I go back to the nuts and bolts and try to do some more theory and try to figure out what won't work and get more guarantees and so on and so forth. So for the younger people in the audience, I want to encourage you, this is not the big era of AI. It is just not, all right? It's not going to work in the way that people are talking about it. Um, we're just kind of learning some mappings from some data, and there are some problems associated. There was a nice panel this morning on the, on the issues that are now rightfully coming up. And it's not because we thought we were going to solve the big problems and suddenly we see their problems. Um, it's rather, this is an engineering discipline that's going to take decades to roll out, just like chemical engineering, just like civil engineering. And, and I, I wasn't around in those eras, but the 50s and 40s when those were rolling out, I bet they didn't have the level of hype that we have now. Right? So I have a lot of respect for what they did. Um, they changed the world. So I think that this, uh, we're building, in some sense, the first engineering discipline for humans. You know, chemical engineering and civil engineering weren't really about humans. I mean, we have built buildings that people lived in. But this is really something that's really all about humans and their interaction with, with, um, with science and technology. Um, and so that's an exciting but extremely challenging thing to do. So we need to be sober and take the decades it needs to be taken to do this. Um, so I think I've said enough about that, but um, just to give you a little of the context of what I'm thinking about. So optimization is a wonderful playground, but it's a, it's a, it's a lingua franca. It's, it's a place where many people come to and talk together. Um, so it came out of many, many fields, and many have contributed. And I think not that many people went into optimization as their first field. They kind of end up there later in life when they realize how useful it is and how communicative it becomes to work in that field. Um, OK, so let me start then with some, some of the actual content here. Okay, so it's certainly played an increasingly central role in statistical machine learning. Uh, it can't really be the whole story because machine learning is also about uncertainty, and so you need sampling ideas and all that. Just optimizing can't be the whole story, but it has really been very, very central. It supplies algorithms, that's great, uh, but it also supplies lower bounds and therefore fundamental shifts. So let me say something about that. When I learned optimization, it was in the 1980s. I was a student, and uh, I took some classes and read some books. And it was presented to me as a field that was dead and done and, and, and a big success. You had simplex method, you had conjugate gradients, you had Newton's method, and so on. And they really worked, and there were rates of convergence, and there was good software, and it was just a tool to be used by everybody. And there was this famous book by Press et al. that you just picked up and used it. All right? And that was in the 1980s. Um, so great. Um, that was false. It was not dead and done at all. So there were a couple of revolutions happening around that time, mostly associated with the uh, former Soviet Union. And that's another connection to Ben. I think that may be why Ben was so interested in optimization. He kind of picked that up. Um, and one of the revolutions was called the interior point method. Uh, it was developed also in the US, but the Russians really, really took it much, much further. Uh, and it was just a, you know, a, a older but, but a re revitalized perspective on how to do optimization. And it's had a huge impact. But the other one was gradient-based optimization. So, um, you know, in stochastic gradients and stochastic approximation, and these ideas that went back to the 50s, uh, but they were picked up in that era and taken to the really a beautiful level. And in particular, lower bounds were discovered. And that's a conceptual leap. Most fields don't have lower bounds. Um, statistics has lower bounds. Computer science has very few. And I think it's a sign of the maturity of a field that has lower bounds. And optimization finally got lower bounds in about circa 1970. Um, and so this was all done in the Russian school. And once you get lower bounds, you start to get fundamental understanding. You see the best you can possibly do. And so that strips away a lot of the details of specific algorithms and tells you about what's the best you can possibly do. All right? Now, that's an interesting concept because we're doing optimization here. So we're developing optimization algorithms. So we're asking for the best optimization algorithm, the optimal optimization algorithm. So already, that's kind of conceptually neat. What could that possibly mean? All right, so that kind of thought inspires a lot of my work here and the work of others in this field. And that's the kind of thing I, again, say Ben would have loved, this kind of recursivity and um, you know, so on. So let's get into that. Um, now, once that happened in the 80s, um, it, it, as is often the case, brand new issues came out. And it was realized that this field is not done at all. There's a lot of open problems. And, and as now as people with statistical interests have moved into this field and started to use it, uh, it's even more clear how many problems are open. So I hope by the end of this talk you see that I'm not actually trying to show you any real results. I'm just trying to show you some cool problems and some open areas. OK, so uh, let's talk about saddle points a little bit. 
So this could be some work that's actually joint with Sham Kakad in the audience. Uh, you have a lot of good people in optimization here at UW. Sham is a particularly noteworthy person who has kind of helped, from, from whom I've learned quite a bit from his papers and with talking with him. So we used to think, at least in the 1980s, that bad local minimum were the main problem, uh, kind of learning about these from the complexity theorists that told us that that, that was the source of all the complexities and uh, physicists uh, with spin glasses and so on. Um, and as time has gone on, it's sort of has not been the case that it's been the local minima. That a lot of problems, there are no local minima, it's, and, and, but there are a lot of saddle points. Saddle points in two or three dimensions don't look like, a, look like a big deal. There's kind of like a little saddle, and you just kind of move your way around it. But in 100,000 dimensions, saddle points can be a very, very big deal. It might be that almost all the dimensions are bad ones, you stay stuck, and it's hard to find the dimension that gets you out. And if you have lots of saddle points, you'll get stuck for a long time, you'll move to the next one, you'll get stuck for a long time, and you'll get kind of stuck for way too long, for months. And in fact, if you train a neural net, and I won't say the word neural net ever again in this talk, but <laughs> if you train one, it goes down in the air, and then it flat, flattens out. All right, and then after a while, it goes down again, and it flattens out. Those are saddle points. All right, and it's probably a ring of saddle points, and then another ring, and it's kind of going past those rings, the 100,000 dimensions, or a million dimensions. All right, so understanding the behavior on saddle points is actually really probably a good chunk of the problem here. Okay, so what ingredients are we going to use? Uh, you know, and what's going to be in our toolbox? Well, again, we're going to be mathematicians in this talk. We're going to simplify. So we're going to use a few ingredients. Gradient descent, critically. Stochastics, critically. Partly for algorithmic speed reasons, but also because we are statisticians too, and we want to always have probability in mind. And then we're going to talk a bit about acceleration, because acceleration, you want to move as fast as possible. We're trying to move as fast as possible, so we have to have some notion that you're accelerating. All right, that's one of the reasons why we have those ingredients. The other is just that experience has taught us that, that the simpler the methods, the better they tend to work and scale. And so as computer scientists, we're interested critically in scaling and in robustness and working. And the more complex methods with second order and Hessians and so on um, are, not, are a little bit deprecated right now because they don't scale and they don't tend to be very robust. Now that will end, the pendulum will swim back, but these three ingredients are already getting us quite far in our thinking. So here's a saddle point. Um, with the saddle shape. We're going to be talking about strict saddle points uh, where there is a, uh, a negative eigenvalue which is strictly negative. And our question is going to be how to escape these things efficiently. Now here's a computer science word. Uh, we don't want it to take exponential time to escape a saddle point if exponential is exponential in the number of dimensions, for example. That would be a disaster in 100,000 dimensions. So can we do some theory and, and develop some algorithms that assure that this doesn't happen? Okay, so here is this first little line of work. I'm going to put together a whole bunch of little lines of work, and this one will probably be one of the longer ones. And again, uh, uh, Cham is on the list there, but also Chi Jin, student at Berkeley, Rong Gu, and Pranit Netrapali. So it's a very just geographically distributed collection of people. All right, so a few facts from some recent work that um, you know, several people have been doing uh, is gradient descent. Well, this is an old algorithm. It goes back to at least Newton, and some historian can tell me how much further it goes back. Uh, but you're going down the steepest descent direction. Um, now, um, in discrete time, it's kind of hard to analyze some of these things. So it's often useful to go into continuous time and develop a differential equation. When you go into continuous time with gradient descent, you get something called gradient flow. And that's been studied by the mathematicians for a long, long time. Okay? It's just a differential equation that flows along the gradient. Right? And there's something called Morse theories. Um, there's an area of mathematics that tells you that with probability one, you will not end up at a saddle point if you're doing gradient flow. I mean, but it had been an open problem for the discrete version, just gradient ascent. If I start gradient ascent in an arbitrary place, could I end up kind of sucked in, sucked in, sucked in, and just kind of asymptotically end up at a saddle point, right? And we did some kind of Morse theory kind of arguments to show that that's not the case, all right? But that is an asymptotic argument, all right? So no efficiency statement, all right? Can you say something about efficiency? Well, there's a negative result. We had a follow-up paper which showed that gradient ascent, even though asymptotically it'll never end up at a saddle point, it can take exponential time uh, to escape saddle points. Right? So it does get sucked in for kind of a long time and then sucked in for a long time and sucked in for a long time. And you set that up in a not too weird way such that it'll take exponential time to actually finally get past all the saddle points. So that was a, that was a negative result. All right? But now there's an important paper, Gu et al., uh, that showed it turns out if you just add, sto you do stochastic gradient, which we all love for other reasons, uh, it can actually escape uh, saddle points in polynomial time. So we went from exponential to polynomial, the things that computer scientists love to do. All right, now their polynomial was not necessarily good. Polynomial is not good enough for us. We want fast. We want linear or sublinear. Logarithmic is where we are typically trying to get. But nonetheless, that, as usual, opened up the, oh, maybe one can go faster. All right, 
Okay, so let's set up a little structure here. Let's do convex optimization at first. So we have a minimum of a convex function, a d-dimensional space. Here is gradient ascent, which Isaac Newton would have recognized. And I should say the date on this talk was J January 15th, because I gave this talk at the Newton Institute in, uh, in uh, Cambridge. And uh, as I was giving the talk, there's this huge portrait of Newton sitting right there. And I realized, as you can see, there's several other ingredients that Newton would recognize in this talk. And I kept kind of turning to him and saying, see? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I left that date on here just because it's kind of stamped in to me. Uh, so anyway, there's, there's Newton's algorithm. Um, uh, so it converges provably to a global minimum. And here's the critical part, is that the number of iterations that it takes to get to global minimum is independent of dimensionality. And I, think, and I don't think that's widely enough appreciated. Everyone thinks gradient ascent is just good because it's steepest descent, it's cheap and all that. But it's, it's number of iterations is independent of dimensions. You could do it in infinite dimensions and it's just as fast in terms of number of iterations, which is amazing. Okay, now, but what about the world that we mostly really care about, these convex, uh, non-convex problems? So now we can have local minima, saddle points, and local maxima, and all that. All right, now here's a list of problems that are actually non-convex, um, but they don't have any local minima, provably. And more, so they have a bunch of saddle points, uh, but it turns out, moreover, all those saddle points are strict saddle points. So they don't have these kind of flat, bad regions that could get you really stuck, and you couldn't say much. So these are really interesting problems. There's not neural nets up here, but these are other areas, if you're a machine learning person, that you need to know about that, that really work in real world applications. Um, so you know, a lot of them, phase retrieval, matrix sensing, these are you know, a lot of practical applications of these. So no spurious local minimum, all pass off. So if you can avoid these things efficiently, you're done. You solve the problem. You get to the global optimum. OK, so let's set up some structure um, to talk about convergence. Um, so we need a bit of smoothness uh, so we can say anything at all. So here's the standard assumption. We assume that we have a gradient, which is Lipschitz, that if you move between two points x and y, that the gradient doesn't change much as relative to the distance. Um, and we now talk about a first order stationary point. If the gradient were zero, that would be the classical notion of a stationary point from calculus. So we put a little epsilon ball around that, and we say, how long does it take to hit that epsilon ball? Then we do that for various values of epsilon, so now we get a rate. Okay. All right, and here's the theorem. Let's call it, let's say it's due to Nesterov, um, which is that gradient descent with a certain choice of step size, the one over the Lipschitz constant, uh, finds one of these guys in a number of iterations which is proportional to one over epsilon squared. This is somewhat of a slow rate, but not too bad. Um, and that's true for um, any convex function. Okay, Lipschitz, smooth convex function. All right, we have a penalty, we have a distance to the original distance that has to be, if you start really far away, you're just gonna take a long time to get there, fine. And then we have a very simple two, two times L sort of expression here. But then again, here is the key, which is that this is independent of dimension, number of iterations. Okay, so that's the best one could kind of possibly hope for for a gradient style algorithm. All right, so now what are we gonna try to do? Well, we're gonna try to now go to beyond that. We're gonna try to avoid saddle points. That algorithm will get stuck at saddle points, potentially. Um, so now we're going to define uh, a second order stationary point. Um, so first of all, we need a little bit more smoothness assumption. We need a Hessian to exist, and we need it to be uh, Lipschitz. We don't want to move around and the Hessian changes a lot, then we wouldn't know how to get out of the saddle point, really. Um, so we're going to make that assumption. We have now a parameter rho. Uh, we, uh, the second order stationary point is, again, that we have this first order stationarity plus the minimum eigenvalue of the Hessian has got to be greater than or equal to. If that were zero, that would be your classical notion of a not saddle point, but we get ourselves a little slop again to have a little ball around the solution so we can get a rate. And that ball happens to be parameterized by rho times epsilon with a square root. It's just a standard parameterization. Uh, and that's it, okay? But, but it's, it's proportional to the rho of the, of the um, Lipschitz bound. All right, now we're gonna analyze an extremely simple algorithm, uh, and it's a mathematician's algorithm, one that you can analyze and say something about, um, but it also is something you can implement in practice. All right, so it is just gradient descent. All right, but from time to time, we're going to add noise from a ball uh, of radius r uh, selected um, uniformly. Okay, now time to time means that we're going to not let this happen too much. And so this perturbation condition is that if the gradient happens to be really small, where you're currently at, and you haven't added perturbations too recently. Okay, so a little bit of a, of a hysteresis, if you will. Uh, if that's true, now you add some noise, all right? And the noise is isotropic. All right, so that's a dumb little bit of stochasticity that we've added to gradient ascent. We needed something like that because gradient ascent itself has, will, hit, will take exponential time. That would be bad. Um, so we've done this little bit of uh, extra noise. And here's the results. So uh, here is the, uh, 
convergence rate now. Uh, now we're, we're looking to second order stationary points. Nesterov looked at first order stationarity. So we have again these Hessian Lipschitz assumptions. We set this, the learning rate to a certain choice. And now we're going to find a second order stationary point in a number of iterations. Well, that looks exactly the same as before. And it is, except for that little tilde sign right there. But, but before we get to that, it is 1 over epsilon squared still. So we're able to evaluate saddle points just as fast as gradient ascent in the convex case. This is the non-convex case. Right? That's a pretty striking fact about gradient ascent, which is it doesn't seem to be too troubled by, by saddle points. All right. Moreover, we have the Lipschitz constant there, and everything is the same. And so what does that tilde mean? That's where we're hiding the dimension dependence. But the dimension dependence is logarithmic, polylogarithmic. It's logarithm to the fourth power, d. Okay? And d it could be 100,000. That's not a bad penalty to pay to avoid saddle points. So if you want to pump this result up to the most you can, you would say that perturbed form of gradient ascent goes through the saddle points as if they're almost not there. Okay? And so this, to me, is one of the first kind of proofs that... Um, establishes why gradient ascent is so effective in things like neural nets. Oops, I said it twice. Uh, in high dimensions. All right, so here just to summarize what we got. So Nesterov for convex problems, I got this rate. We get exactly the same rate up to this penalty of log to the fourth. Now, is that for real? Uh, probably not. Probably that's an artifact of the proof technique. Um, but um, uh, And I suspect log is a lower bound, but I don't think we know a lower bound currently for this problem. All right, now here's a little bit of the history, just briefly. I already alluded to this. Um, but uh, here are a bunch of different methods that do find second-order stationary points. We've been talking about the ones based on gradients. But you could also go to Hessians, and this is a little more of a classical literature. Uh, if you give me a Hessian, um, you know, maybe you can get a Hessian cheaply, but in a lot of problems you can't. But if you did, then I can compute the eigenstructure of it, and I could find the negative eigenvalue direction, and I could just hop out. All right. And so if you do the analysis there, you get a faster rate. It's 1 over epsilon to the 1.5. All right. But these algorithms are not being used, at least in most of the problems I'm aware of. There is an intermediate set of things where you allow yourself a Hessian vector product. And this is interesting, because that is something you can do realistically in lots of problems. And you get a faster rate here, 1.75, and you get this nice log d dependence. So this is a um, you know, bunch of people, mostly at Stanford. Um, and I think it's very interesting and competitive. These will, this will kind of play out over the years to come as to which of these approaches. Anyway, we're up in gradient land here. There was the original Gu et al. work, and it was just polynomial. So not you know, nice, but you know, not, that, not that strong of an assertion. There was a, then a paper by Levy um, uh, who, who was able to prove d to the third and still polynomial in 1 over epsilon. Um, and then this work goes all the way down to 1 over epsilon squared, a good polynomial, and then does logarithm to the fourth, uh, starting to get to you know, the lowest it could probably possibly be. Um, just a little word about proof technique here. Um, so uh, really, this is differential geometry. This is just we're trying to prove something about the geometry of uh, saddle points and how they interact with dynamics, a particular kind of gradient dynamics. All right, so you'd like to analyze around a saddle point where is the kind of the bad region, where if you're in that, it's going to take you a long time to get out. All right? And this is a probabilistic statement because I'm going to be adding noise from time to time, and the noise will maybe get me out of that region. And if I'm out of the region, then kind of just the power method will get me out. I have a negative eigenvalue, boom, it'll just shoot me out. So I need to know how thick that region is. Um, and the uh, argument that's used in this proof is, is a coupling kind of argument. You don't know what that region looks like. You could probably do some differential geometry to figure out more about it. Um, but what you do is you start a, a, a coupled pair of processes. It's a probability argument. You start a coupled pair of processes on both sides of this region. Uh, a width r apart where you don't know what r is. And now you adjust r until these two things start to flow quickly apart from each other when a phase transition occurs. Now you know you're at the right value of r, and, and you choose that as your r. And that r is capturing now a pancake-like shaped object that's pretty thin. And that gives you this rate of logarithm to the d. The previous work had replaced this whole argument with a flat slab, and the slab um, was too thick. Right? And so in high dimensions especially, that's where you get the d cubed. OK, so I always like it. Again, I think Ben would love the probability coming together with the differential geometry coming together with the algorithms. All right. OK, so that was the pre first line of work I want to talk about. Um, all right, now let's talk about, uh, uh, let's go further. We're going to talk about um, saddle points. Um, can we get past the saddle points even faster? So there's this notion of Nesterov acceleration, which if you know about optimization, is one of the big discoveries of the last 40 years, uh, about how fa what's the fastest you can go. It, it kind of gives you insight into that. 
And so do those techniques allow us to move past saddle points quickly? What other kinds of stochastic models can we use to escape saddle points? Not, there's just this brown ball of noise. Is there other better ways? And how do these two kind of ideas interact? So this is kind of the last year of research. Um, and to get there, we're going to need to have a deeper understanding of acceleration that's been available in the literature to date. So we just sort of say what it is. The deeper understanding is, is based on going into continuous time and to start talking about differential equations and stochastic differential equations. And this will be a shock to the computer scientists in the room. They thought they could develop their whole career outside of differential equations. Okay? Um, and I'm going to tell you that's wrong. And it's because these optimizations, these algorithms that hop around in a space, you don't have any real topology. So it's hard to talk about notions like acceleration and going faster because you're just hopping along the sequence of space. You need some embedding into a continuum. All right? And that embedding leads to uh, insights. There's going to be phase transitions in continuous world, which you don't see in the discrete world. And so it's phase transitions, which are, which are giving us the difference in, in speeds. Okay, so I'll get there in a minute. All right, so this work uh, is one of my favorite lines of work in the last few years. Uh, and it's principally been led by two of my favorite grad students, Andre. Well, they're all my favorite. That's not fair. But <laughs> I'm, I'm pumping their work right now. So Andre Wibbison and Aisha Wilson have really mightily contributed to this in the last uh, several years now. And then Mike Betancourt from Columbia has joined us in the last little phase of this research to help us along a bit. Um, okay, so. Uh, so let me be now really provocative and grandiose sounding, which I normally am not. I'm provocative, but not grandiose. Um, all right, so uh, this, this, in, in mature fields, ones that are mathematically really seem deep and mature, at least in my experience, there's a really deep interplay between integration and differentiation. You can call that interplay the fundamental theorem of calculus, all right? Also, Talegrand's work and you know, um, uh, quantum field theory does a lot of this. Uh, really mature fields, you uh, sometimes work with the integrals and sometimes work with derivatives, and you go back and forth. And these can be very generalized notions of these objects. So physics is certainly is the poster child of this. There was Newton who wrote down F equals MA. It's, a, it's based on derivatives. It's a set of different, it's a differential equation, right? And wrote down the laws of nature using derivatives. Um, then Lagrange came around about 100 years later and said, I could rewrite all of that using integrals. So I'm going to integrate an energy. And moreover, I'm going to optimize over paths under those integrals. So he introduced also optimization, not just integrals. And then he gets out the same physics that Newton got out using this other formalism. It's often all called variational. All right? um, and as you probably know, that led to then Hamilton's perspectives, and that led to a lot of the 20th century physics was based on that. But a good physics goes back and forth all the time. All right? A good probabilist goes back and forth all the time. Um, statistics is full of these kind of arguments. Um, you know, if you're doing Laplace expansions or saddle point expansions, that's a derivative in the complex plane for the purposes of doing integrals. Um, the numerical disciplines, finite elements, is take a PDE and turn it into a bunch of little integrals, patches that you put together in a variational way. Uh, Monte Carlo, uh, hybrid Monte Carlo, the best existing Monte Carlo algorithms are based on taking a derivative to get fast speed as you move along in some direction. So I could go on, but um, I think this is true, that fields that kind of go on both sides of this are really somehow, somehow somewhat deep. Um, I would argue that a lot of our computational fields of this century are not so deep in that regard. In particular, I'd argue that optimization is not, so maybe surprisingly. It's all full of derivatives. Everywhere you see, in every paper, it's tons of derivatives and Hessians and border derivatives or whatever. Uh, but almost never see an integral sign. And there's not a variational perspective from, you know, as, as fundamental in, in that field. So um, uh, one could argue this, but I'm going to put it out there. Um, you know, so I think there's an opportunity to take a variational perspective on optimization, to ask, what is the best optimization algorithm? That's, in essence, a variational question. And it's going to require the other side of the coin. OK. All right, so let's go back now to gradient descent again. So here's gradient descent. I'm now using uh, k as my variable and not n. Um, so again, known for hundreds of years. What's maybe not so known is it has a convergence rate. So now we're starting to talk about computational complexity. So we're doing convex optimization in this part of the talk. All right? And what this convergence rate is is that after you've gone through k steps, no matter what the convex function is, I can guarantee you'll be within a, si a ball of size 1 over k of the optimum. All right? So that is not an old idea. That's you know, maybe in the last few decades. Uh, it's a kind of two or three pages of proof um, using you know, Lipschitz, convexity, uh, you know, Jensen's inequalities, and so on. Uh, so, um, but anyway, it's a, it's a nice fact that we can analyze uh, the rate of this. So already we're starting to do something a little more computer science-y to have an actual rate over a class of functions, not just for a specific function. OK, now at some point, um, various of the Russian school, Nemirovsky is the most well-known name uh, having done this, in the 70s started asking, can I get a complexity theory? 
of, the, of optimization. And I think it was a really important moment where he, he, he didn't just go to Turing and say, well, the complexity theory already exists, the computer scientist gave it to me, because that complexity model is just too, too, too strong. You can do anything with a Turing computer. So you can't say much. And I think that's, I mean, with all due apologies to the complexity theory of the audience, you can't say much, right? Um, so Nimrovsky said, no, I'm going to have a different computational model. It's going to be an oracle model. And so, for example, if I'm looking at optimization of convex functions, what I'm going to do is the computer is allowed to know the function value, the gradient at any point that it wants, and it's allowed to take its steps within the linear span of all previous gradients. So that's a computer. That's a computational model. Okay? It's a pretty strong one. It's not everything. It's not Turing complete. All right? But you can prove things with it now. Right? And in fact, you see nowadays in complexity theory, like fine-grained complexity and kind of relative complexity is starting to emerge. It has, a, it has this, this flavor. All right, so he said, well, given that computational model, uh, what's the fastest you can go? All right, and, and this, this framework is rich enough to actually give an answer, and the answer turned out to be 1 over k squared. All right, so it's faster than gradient descent, which is maybe a little surprising because gradient descent is steepest descent. If you're only allowed to look at gradients, you better go down the steepest direction and go you know, as far as you can, and we're giving you the optimal step size. So I think probably I wasn't around in that era. They were a little surprised that there could be a better rate. So probably people said, well, that lower bound is just too low. We need to get a better lower bound that's a little higher. All right? And it was maybe a shock to everybody when, ne when Nesterov, a student of Nemirovsky's, wrote down this pair of equations. Um, it's called Nesterov acceleration. There's now two variables, not just one. One of them does gradient ascent in the x variable, but that's now the y variable. And then the x variable is kind of a combination, an extrapolation, a rotation, if you will of the last two x variables. So it has a little bit of a momentum flavor or a heavy ball flavor. It has a lot of intuitions. All right, but the amazing thing is that the Nesterov not just invented this, but he proved that it has a rate of 1 over k squared, beating gradient descent, All right, which is pretty astonishing given that it's only using gradients and it's not going down the steepest descent direction. Moreover, this algorithm will occasionally go back uphill, All right, which is amazing. If you're trying to get down this hill as fast as possible, how could that possibly be? Um, so I think it's safe to say that a lot of people have worked on this, that there's um, a lot of math, but there's not a huge amount of understanding to this day about the phenomenon. Where is it coming from? Why is this the optimal algorithm? Why is it reaching the lower bound? And so on. All right, so I'm going to argue that the best way, at least I think, to understand that is to go into continuous time. That just in discrete time, you're not going to see the phenomenon. Okay, so um, yes, in the last 40 years, there's been all kind of accelerations of classical methods. They're all really... Um, interesting, they're based on kind of the algebra associated with uh, Nesterov, but not really, a, a, there's not an underlying generative principle, if you will, for uh, this class of methods. Okay, so um, let's now go into continuous time. All right, so there is gradient flow at the top. It's just a differential equation, it takes the gradient, it goes downhill. You don't need a step size. If you discretize that equation, you get out steepest descent. All right, well, it depends. There's two different ways, several different ways to discretize it. If you discretize it with explicit Euler method, you get out gradient descent. Uh, if you discretize it with implicit Euler, you get out a prox method. Now, that's cool, but also you can analyze the convergence rate of this in continuous time. And um, using the same kind of tools we did in discrete time, actually a little easier. And the convergence rate turns out to be 1 over t. Maybe not a big surprise, because gradient descent was 1 over k. This is now 1 over t, sort of some similar, similar rate. Okay, and in a very nice paper, Sue Boyd and Candace at Stanford said, what if we take the Nesterov pair of equations and uh, do the same thing? Take the, the step size to zero, out will pop some differential equation, and there is the differential equation that pops out. So not surprisingly, it's second order because we had two equations. Uh, it's non-homogeneous, and there's a mysterious three sitting up there, and then you have the gradient. So it looks kind of like a, a little bit of an oscillatory thing driven by a gradient. You can't solve it, but you can analyze it using best cell functions and understand a little bit about how it moves around. Um, and so that was very nice, very interesting. Um, we looked at that and were inspired by this and said, is there a underlying, where did that differential equation come from? Why that differential equation? Why is it the best one? Is there an underlying generative principle? So I think of this as much like Lagrange looking at, uh, at Newton's equations, F equals MA, and says, okay, that's a nice equation, it seems to work, but where does it come from? Why, why that equation? Okay, is there an underlying uh, principle? Okay. All right, so here's our, our attempt to deliver such a principle. So I've just written it down here, and I'll take, take a couple of minutes trying to unpack this. Um, so we call this a Bregman-Lagrangian. This is a function of the state space, x where you are. We also have a derivative, x dot, and it's also a function of time. This would be all time varying. 
It's got two main pieces to it. There's this part right here and this part right here. Okay, so let's focus first of all on this. First of all, all these alphas, betas, and gammas are just time scaling functions that are degrees of freedom of, of the space of algorithms. We don't just want one algorithm, we want a whole space, and so we give ourselves these degrees of freedom. So they're not the important part. All right, the important part is uh, these two pieces. So um, this piece right here is the function you're trying to go downhill on, so the, the f scaled in some way, okay? So that's kind of like a potential energy, you wanna go down. We also have a term here which is gonna be kind of like a kinetic energy, which is now a, is known as a Bregman divergence. This is a Bregman divergence uh, between a point x and a, an extrapolated point. So what is a Bregman divergence? Uh, it's this little equation here if you want. Uh, it's based on an auxiliary function h, and it measures distance between x and y using h. So this picture might be better than the equation for some of you. Um, if I wanna measure distance between x and y on this axis, what I do is I put down a function h, and I take the linear approximation to h at x, and go out there and get a discrepancy between the linear approximation and the actual function h, and that red distance is the distance between x and y using this auxiliary function h. It's called the Bregman divergence between x and y. If h is just quadratic, this is a fancy way of writing down the Euclidean distance between x and y. It's a variational way of doing that. But if h is logarithmic, you get a kullback leader divergence, and h can be all kinds of other things uh, and has been studied widely in convex optimization. Um, Bregman, by the way, I think is Russian-Israeli. I don't remember. Does anyone happen to know? Can I like to make connections? Uh, the Russians were behind a lot of this work that came out in the 80s for obvious kind of reasons. Um, um, so uh, that's the Bregman divergence. Now, what, how are we using the Bregman divergence? In an interesting way, I think. We're measuring the Bregman between at point x and x plus a time scale derivative. So it's a little bit of a, like elasticity, if you will. How much uh, energy are you paying if you move in the direction that the, the, the momentum seems to be carrying you? Okay, um, so we measure that, and let's call that a kinetic energy. And in fact, if h is chosen to be quadratic, this whole thing reduces to just one half x dot squared, which is kinetic energy. So this becomes literally a Lagrangian that happens to be time varying. All right, so now why do I think that this is an interesting object to be studying? Uh, well, first of all, what do you do with Lagrangians? You put them inside of an integral, and then you optimize the, over the paths. And that will give you the particular path that, that we argue you should be following if you're trying to optimize in the optimal way. Okay, so let's go to that. Here's what Lagrange told us how to do. We take our Lagrangian and we put it inside of an integral and then we optimize over paths and maybe we picked out this particular path here. All right, and then the mathematics is called calculus of variations. You just, in essence, set all partial errors equal to zero and that's in, in functional analysis called the Euler-Lagrange equations. And so it's just take a bunch of partial derivatives of this thing and a, and a total time derivative. And once you do that, you'll get to get out a differential equation. You'll get some x's and some x dots and some x double dots. And so let's do that. And it's a, it's a two-line little uh, derivation. And so here you get out this master differential equation. All right? It looks awful, maybe, to you, but I love it. It looks beautiful to me. Um, it's got second order. It's got a non-homogeneous component. And then here's a whole bunch of geometry. Just That's geometry to me. And then there's a gradient. All right? If h is quadratic, if we pick alpha and beta in a particular way as p log t, um, and if, what else do we do? Um, yeah, if we just do all of that, then that differential equation reduces to the suboid and can dissipate the thing, okay? But moreover, this differential equation under particular settings of alpha, gamma, and h, and beta, uh, comes up with all the known, at least the, one, the acceleration algorithms that I know of in the literature. They're continuous time versions. So it seems to be a generator of accelerated algorithms. So that's already kind of cool that we were able to unify them in, in one differential equation. All right, but now what can you get more out of this? What mathematical other facts can you learn from having written all this stuff down? Um, well, first thing you might want to do is get a rate. You'd like to know, can I get a general rate once and for all, not having to do spec algorithm specific rates, which is the literature has been doing for all the discrete time algorithms. All right, and so those rates are begotten. It's not that painful, but it's two or three pages typically of, of calculation. The amazing thing here is you get a rate with just one line proof for this entire family of things. And I'll just show you that proof on the next page. So here is the rate. Uh, it's, uh, the rate is uh, a big O of e to the minus beta t. So beta t is that degree of freedom you have as a designer. So here it's already kind of interesting. You get to pick your rate. So we're gonna return to that in a minute. All right, you, you pick the rate. So anyway, it's this, and here's the proof. You just write down what's called a Lyapunov function. Here's a Lyapunov function involving the Bregman divergence and involving the optimum. You take its first time derivative, you ask that that be negative, so you go downhill in this particular Lyapunov function, and this happens if and only if this occurs. So it's a one-line proof. 
All right, uh, Asia Wilson, who I mentioned earlier, has done another couple of papers that are quite beautiful, other Lyapunov functions that explore the whole space of Lyapunov functions, both in discrete and continuous time and linking them. So it's a very nice little magnum opus. Um, anyway, that's already kind of interesting. It looks like we've learned something about this. Um, but can we learn anything more? All right, now here's what, then, then this something really interesting happened. And this is where I think it finally starts to get uh, interesting. Maybe it's been tedious till now, but anyway. Um, so let's suppose that I, so I, as I said, I get to pick the rate. And that seems odd because, uh, you know, don't, aren't we just kind of given to us by the algorithm? So let's suppose if I pick a rate which is, uh, you know, log, I set beta t to be logarithm of t, okay? Uh, and so when I take exponential of that, I get 1 over t, which is a rate I know we can achieve with gradient flow, for example. All right, so I, I know I can do that. So anyway, I set beta t equal to that value, and then there's a particular way to set alpha and gamma. They're actually determined by that. I'm not getting into that. And then I set h to whatever. Um, and then I plug this in, I get, a, I get actually gradient great, great flow. It just reduces to gradient flow, okay? Um, yes? Good question. Why don't I just set it to infinity and converge instantly? Good. You, you, you're asking the right question. So um, I'm going to bring you into the conversation here in a moment. <laughs> um, so suppose I set it to logarithm and I get this known algorithm. Great. Suppose that Sham, he's a little smarter than I. He says, I'm going to set it to uh, 2 times logarithm of t. Okay. Now when I take that exponential, he gets out a rate of 1 over t squared. Right. And um, we know there exists such an argument. It's the accelerated version of Nesterov, which does that. Now here's the interesting part. In this space, this x, x dot space, he and I will follow exactly the same path. That's surprising, right? What will happen is that he'll move faster along the path than I am. And all that means is that he's using a different clock than I'm using, all right? And that's not interesting, okay? The path is what's interesting, and we're following the same path. So this Lagrangian has a mathematical property. It's called covariant. And so that means that for any of these choices of beta, we're all following the same path. All right, so now let's suppose that Ed says, no, I'm going to move exponentially, guys. I'm going to set beta of t equal to t. All right, and so I'm moving exponentially fast. And he will now design with his machinery, his Euler-Grange equations, he'll get an algorithm, and it'll move exponentially as fast. He, he will, but it'll move along our same path. So he's really not doing anything new. He just has a different clock. And like Einstein said, the clock doesn't matter. It's not the interesting part of this problem, All right? And our young man here in front, Pedro, says, I'm going to use a super infinite fast clock, and I'm going to go as fast as, you know. and yes, you can, but you will move along our same path just using your weird clock. So. All right, so in continuous time, in some sense, the phenomenon evaporates of acceleration. But that's not what really happened. What happened is that acceleration is not really all about acceleration. It's about the path. There's an optimal path to follow for optimization. Okay? And you would have seen that in discrete time. All right, now what's then interesting, and is the whole story at this point, is how you discretize. How do you go back into computer science land? All right? Because we know in computer science land, we can't discretize at, Ed can't discretize his differential equations. Something's going to break with his exponentially fast thing, all right? Similar to you, you won't be able to do it, but we will be able to, because we pick these less ambitious rates, <laughs> all right? Now, why do we know that? Well, we just have these, these oracle bounds, but there must be some more mathematics that actually tells us that, all right? So let me now move on to the next part of the story, which is, to me is the most interesting. So these are the mysteries about a year ago. Why can't we discretize when we are using exponentially fast clocks or super fast clocks? What happens when we arrive at a clock speeds where we can discretize? Something, what happens in some mathematical sense? So we, we have a signal, a flag that's been raised of some sense. And then once we arrive at that point where we can discretize, how do we discretize? All right, okay. And so I'm going to claim these are all solvable, these problems. And the secret is a technique, or not technique, a beautiful area of mathematics called symplectic integration. Uh, how many of you know what symplectic integration is? Okay. Uh, MIT person over here knows. Um, yeah, it's not widely appreciated. It's a, one of the major areas of mathematics. I'm sure your mathematics department has several symplectic geometers here. When I put it in my abstracts nowadays, it, I, I go give talks, a few of these people show up. And they usually have gray beards, and they're sitting there in the back um, looking bored, but then they lighten up when I get to this part of the talk. <laughs> um, all right, so what is symplectic integration? I think I have a slide that says something. Yes. All right, so uh, this was developed in the late 80, 1800s by some people that you will recognize. Hamilton, Poincaré, Jacobi, a bunch of these kind of people. All right, what, what were they trying to do? Well, at that era, they had a whole bunch of interesting differential equations. They had Newton's equations, but they had Maxwell's equations and a whole bunch of others, fluid equations. And they were saying, they were very prescient, they were saying, um, how could we discretize these differential equations? They didn't have computers yet, but somehow they were already thinking ahead. All right, and um, they asked the following question, well, 
the true flow of these differential equations gives us certain paths that have certain mathematical properties. They, for example, conserve energy. They conserve momentum. There's physical laws. There's certain invariances along these paths. If I discretize, I'm going to hop along a discrete collection of points, and I'll have an approximation error. That's fine. We have to tolerate that. But if I hop in a certain way that I'm losing momentum or losing energy, uh, I'm not doing the real physics anymore. And that would be just wrong. All right. And they were very prescient, because now if you were to do that nowadays with, say, simulating the galaxies, the, the cosmos, or simulating the climate, or a protein folding, and you did it in the wrong way, you would bleed away energy momentum. I mean, you just get bad answers, just bad physics. So people don't do that. Why? Because these guys figured out a way to do it the right way. And uh, what the right way to do it is, is that there is a class of methods that will exactly preserve energy momentum, even as they're doing a discrete approximation of the differential equation. And those are called symplectic integrators. Um, roughly speaking, well, so what is the idea? Um, so I, I knew about this back at MIT. I sat in on sat down some differential equations courses when I was a young assistant professor. And I heard about this a little bit, and I just kind of remembered it. Um, and um, I remember the following idea, which is that uh, uh, if you think about a uh, classical differential equation, it's a, it's a vector field. And you're flowing along the vector field. So at any given point, there's an arrow leaving that point, and you follow that arrow for a little bit of time. Symplectic perspective is different. At every given point, there's a little triple of vectors. And that defines a little volume element. And if you take the determinant of that volume element, you get a, you get a volume. Right? And so now, as that volume element flows forward in the flow, it's going to shear in some way. And I want its volume to stay constant. Right? And the volume is just a determinant, so that's just a little piece of mathematics. Right? And so you work out an integrator, which as it moves along discreetly, preserves exactly these volumes. And then you can generalize this to volumes in phase space and then to exterior forms in, differenti in differential geometry. In fact, this drove a lot of the development, early development of differential geometry. OK, now the actual algorithms turn out to be kind of interesting and not that surprising. So if you'll remember, when you discretize differential equations, you'll take like maybe the explicit method, which looks at where you currently are and the gradient where you are, and then it moves forward. Another, the implicit approach, takes where you currently are and looks at the gradient of where you're going to move to and uses that gradient. All right? And mathematically, this is just looking one way or the other. Right? The latter, you have to solve a little implicit equation, but you can often do it. Neither one of those are symplectic. They will bleed away energy or momentum. But if you interlace them in a particular way, some terms will cancel, and you will exactly conserve these, these, these things. So I remember learning about this, and then I learned the other interesting fact is, is because these symmetries are being preserved, these little triples, um, this has much better error control properties. Much less error is accrued as you move along, because it's kind of a stability of this. A lot of things are canceling. Right? And so you can move much farther. Uh, step sizes can be turned up by a, by a large factor. All right, and that's critical for these large-scale applications. So no one who does uh, serious chemistry or physics nowadays uses anything other than symplectic integrators, at least in my understanding. All right, so why did I think about looking into this a little bit? Well, because if you can move as fast as possible with these integrators, that's what acceleration is, is somehow is. So it must be relevant. So uh, just I'm going to now kind of cut to the chase a little bit. Um, there is a standard recipe for doing this. You start with a Lagrangian. And the Lagrange is time varying. We need to move into the Hamiltonian framework. There's something called a Legendre transform, um, which is you just do it, and you move into Hamiltonian variables. Um, that's a bit of convex geometry or conjugate duality, if you will. Um, I guess this is Rockefeller's university, so you all know about that. Um, and so we get a new set of variables that include time as an explicit variable. You now have a Hamiltonian, which is time invariant. And there's a standard approach to applying symplectic integrators to that. There's not just one symplectic integrator. So there's a whole family of them. So we picked a particular one. Here's a slide of actually doing this. So this is a particular high dimensional quadratic. Um, and so we write down the quadratic. That's the function f. And we make these other choices that I mentioned and turn that into the Euler-Lagrange equations, or, or, or turn, turn that into Hamiltonian, which turns into a symplectic integrator. And we put that on the computer. So we did no kind of algorithmic choices of any kind. The mathematics just drove us along. And here is the actual convergence. Um, and so that is the oracle rate for this particular function. Um, and so it is doing as advertised. Moreover, it's oscillating. It's not just going downhill. It's going up and down and up and down. Um, all right. So that's really cool. Um, OK, so let me spend uh, the rest of my talk sort of, I, I could go on about that, but the, we, we just wrote a paper last week called On Symplectic Optimization, which is on my home page. So if you're curious, you can see some more details. I, I also wanted to put a slide in here, which I forgot to, which is that if you compare it to Nesterov, Nesterov in this thing also achieves the oracle rate. And then near the bottom, it actually turns down a little bit faster. And that's an interesting phenomenon. It's not part of the dynamics. And so there's a couple of interesting mysteries there. Um, so in some sense, Nesterov is a little bit faster to us if you set the step sizes equal. 
right? But this is a symplectic integrator. You can turn the step size up much more. So when we do that, we really beat Nesteroff. So this actual algorithm actually beats Nesteroff, which is, I, I think, a real achievement. Okay, so real briefly, uh, a follow-up project here, acceleration and saddle points. So this has been an open problem. As I'm moving near a saddle point, let's put our two ideas together now. Uh, acceleration is this kind of momentum I start to build up. It allows me to get downhill as fast as possible. If I've got a lot of momentum and there's a saddle point sitting there, presumably that might help me. I might be able to get past that saddle point, blow by it. I don't see it as much. Okay? But that's that intuition. You know, as usual, you have to try to prove something here is that it could be false, that intuition. Anyway, Chi Jen and Pranith have, fall, have worked, uh, we've worked together on this. And so just really briefly, there has been some existing work um, that, uh, for example, accelerated gradient ascent defines um, uh, in this non-convex setting, epsilon saddle points at a rate of 1 over epsilon squared. Uh, there are some nested loop algorithms where you do something like acceleration inside of another loop. So if you know about interior point methods, they kind of have a Newton inside of a nested loop. And there, there, are, there are algorithms where, where that's reasonable. In our field, these nested loops, I just don't really believe in them. I think we really need to have kind of just a simple algorithm. So anyway, but faster rates have been achieved, not just 1 over epsilon squared, but 1 over epsilon 1.75, if you allow yourself the nesting. All right, so we're asking, can we do this just with basically eight uh, accelerated gradient descent, nothing more fancy. All right, same assumptions as before, uh, Hepstein Lipschitz and gradient Lipschitz. Um, and a goal is the same as before. We want to find a secondary stationary point. Um, here is our algorithm. In the want of time, I'm not going to go through it, but basically this is just accelerated gradient ascent. That's what steps four and five are right there. This is now the same perturbation condition as before. And this is something called non-convex exploitation, um, which uh, I will mention in a minute. Okay. Um, so anyway, here is the result. Uh, now you're hopefully you're getting used to being theoreticians and just looking and understanding these results. This is the convergence rate. It's not epsilon squared, it's epsilon 7 for force. So da-da, proof that acceleration can accelerate you past saddle points. Okay? Uh, moreover, we just have Lipschitz constant and a row up in the top and the usual thing, and then we have that tilde again, and that tilde here is logarithmic in D again. Okay? It's logarithmic to the sixth power now and not the fourth, but again, I think that's just the proof technique. Okay, I'll skip over that. Um, so uh, how does this proof go? Well, you have to use, it turns out, a Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian allows you to handle the fact that um, in this non-convex setting, you're not always doing a descent. Okay? Um, so the Hamiltonian, if you, don't just look, if you just look at the, uh, the function value itself, it's not descending. You're going up and down. If you have the Hamiltonian, you're mostly going down. It takes out a little bit of that, but there's occasional times where you can still go back up. And that's what that NCE step is, is designed to handle. So it's a bit of a patch, if you will. Uh, there may be a generic Hamiltonian here, but this patch is what allows us to prove this theorem. So I'm going to skip over the details here. All right, then two more minutes on um, uh, uh, follow-on. So um, that's, a lot of that works now several months ago. Uh, what we're mostly doing nowadays is trying to ask, what if we put all this sort of stuff together with stochastics? Instead of just doing a perturbation condition, what if we do real stochastic gradient or real diffusions? So if you work in discrete time, uh, those sort of things are called stochastic gradient methods. When you take them into continuous time, they're called diffusions, or more general Markovian processes. And they have rates of convergence. They probably have optimality principles. We, we don't know what they are yet. And so there's a huge number of open problems about what's the fastest way to diffuse? What's the fastest way to sample and diffuse? And how's the dimension dependence go? What about the non-convex case? So you know, I've got a large group now, and everybody's working on this. Um, and I know that people here are working on it, too. There's a lot of people working on it. This project was with one of the students, Shang Cheng, and another student, Eladri Chatterjee, and then Peter Barba joined us for this project. So um, can we accelerate a diffusion? What is a diffusion? Again, it's a continuous time version of stochastic gradient. So think Brownian motion you know, with, a, with a gradient. Um, there have been some negative results, right? But they've focused on what's called overdamp diffusion. So just briefly, uh, the classical diffusion that people have been analyzing here is called Langevin diffusion. Um, Longevin diffusion is just what you might expect. It's the gradient ascent. It takes a gradient and it adds Brownian motion. Okay, so it's, if you're a gradient loving person, it's the first thing you would start with. Okay, but from all the work we've been talking about today, we know that acceleration and getting momentum into these things lets you move faster. So probably we can diffuse faster if we allow momentum. So instead of doing underdamped, sorry, overdamped diffusion, which makes you sluggish, allow yourself some underdamping so you can kind of hop around a little bit more. And so you now get two equations and in, in make an underdamped Langevin, and, and, and you can do that analysis. So can we accelerate that? And I think this is now actually my last slide. Uh, here is the results for overdamped Langevin. This is a very recent uh, results. These are mostly people in France uh, who've been working on this. 
the uh, convergence rate is one over epsilon squared, and it has a factor of d in the, in the, in the numerator. Um, and our new result shows that with underdamped Langevin, more of a momentum kind of method, you can go all the way down to one over epsilon much faster, and the uh, dimension dependence improves to uh, square root of d. Okay, so I am done um, with everything I really wanted to say. Let me just now bump back up to the top level. Um, I hope you appreciate that there are tons of open problems here. And if you have some math background, especially some physics, but not just, um, there are just all kinds of things you can do. And many, many problems are open. And these are the ones that I think are needed to be answered if we're going to have a serious engineering science that gives some guarantees that says this will happen under this situation, that these error bars I'm getting are calibrated, and blah, 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 blah. That we you know, really kind of got stuck um, you know, with, with uh, computer science and statistics, which I think of myself as, a little, as both, really were very, very separate. And the computer scientists gave really strong guarantees with no noise, right? And the statisticians gave guarantees, but with no kind of serious computational thinking, no, no speed of convergence in any serious way, All right? When you put the two together, you can start to solve real world problems. Thank you. Uh, we, can, we have time for a couple of questions from the audience. All the way back in the back. Uh, your thoughts on uh, continuous time approach, uh, what are your thoughts on continuous time approach for uh, nonlinear constraints, right? if you have a problem with nonlinear constraints? Uh, so I, a very good question about what he asked about uh, the constraints, and specifically nonlinear constraints. Um, so uh, I talked almost entirely about unconstrained problems here, as you may have noticed. Um, and it's another one of my list of many open problems to do a lot of these things with, con with uh, constrained optimization. Um, there has been a, a growth of kind of conditional gradient ideas in the last few years, noticing that they're really, really simple ways to impose constraints that scale really well in dimension. And so one of my, all my list of things is to do is kind of redo some of this literature, but with conditional gradient instead of gradient, uh, and do it in continuous time. In fact, in continuous time, you can have the constraint not be just a, you can't go past this. You can have the constraint be a force on your second order differential equation. So you can start to get there and the force pushes you back. I think computationally that's going to be actually a better way to go for constraints than the way we're used to in, in discrete time. Uh, and nonlinear and linear is not really the big issue here. Mo these tools really are, you know, are a bit agnostic to linear and nonlinear. So ideally, you'd like to be neither over damped nor under damped, right? Because if you're under damped, you oscillate and that slows you down. Is there an optimum? No, you don't. So no, um, you want to oscillate. That, that, the proof shows that the oscillation is what gets you the fast speed. It's not a, a perfectly, you know, what, but does, what it you call? The, does it give you the Critical maximum speed? speed? Yeah. Critically damped is slower than the oscillatory. Yeah, it's not quite the same. Your physics intuition helps, but it's not exactly right. Anything else? Please. Uh, not to be basic, but have you compared this to things like Atom um, that optimize neural networks? Yeah. So um, he's asking about Atom, a particular method applied to neural nets. And maybe Sham can kind of help me here. But um, we're in the very early days of optimizing really, really large problems that are you know, non-convex and stochastic and all that. And I think that Atom is just kind of one little step along the way. It's a somewhat ad hoc algorithm for which there's not a lot of theory. Um, and um, there are theoretically well-grounded methods for which are roughly as good or maybe even better. And I think, I think with, at least in my experience, the theoretically motivated stuff wins out. And either Adam will be shown to be, you know, a little descent on Sam Hamiltonian, or, or you can merge them together. My, okay, there's a nice uh, <laughs> merge them. You know, Republicans and Democrats has all come together. <laughs> um, but no, it's a it's a good. Uh, there's not going to be one answer to everything. There's going to be various ingredients that all come together. Per, this particular argument has one particular insight. This has another insight. And a good user of these, it won't be the computer just delivering answers. It'll always be the human sitting in there thinking, how do I put that ingredient together with this? Has a good engineer, should be. A good chemical engineer will build a chemical factory which didn't develop you know, all by itself. Um, in fact, I should say I've written an op-ed on AI the last few days, and I'm going to put it out there at some point, and it's a little polemical. Um, I am unhappy with all the hype over AI, and, um, and it says something like, uh, you know, when chemical engineering and civil engineering were developed, people didn't say the best way to do this is to build an artificial chemist, and then that chemist will know how to build the factory. <laughs> and so for some reason, that's how we're thinking about what we're doing here. Let's build an artificial and general intelligence, and it'll solve all our problems, or kill us, one of the two. 
uh, instead of just thinking about what are the ingredients, how do we as engineers put them together, how do we use them for useful purposes, and so on. Is that a good place to stop? Oh, well, one more. <laughs> So uh, the point of saying representing mathematical formulas and you know these equations for a computer scientist, uh, how and what kind of work are you doing in the area of knowledge representation, where you take a problem and you represent it in a way that a computer scientist can sort of deal with it and understand it better? I love your question uh, about knowledge representation, computer science, and uh, math, <laughs> but I, so the, uh, some part of it I love and some part I don't. Computer scientists should be just as aware of uncertainty and dynamics and optimizations, everybody else. Don't call yourself a computer science and wall yourself off from that, please. But also, all the other people out there should be aware of knowledge representation and ontologies and relational things and first order things and reasoning, all right? And just to give, I, I think so many people know this, I love natural language processing, which I think is a field that brings all these things together. And actually, I, someone asked me if I had a lot of money, what I would do with it, I'd spend it on solving the NLP problems. Because it does. You have to think about representation. And uh, don't get me started, but here they are. They're loving me again. So, <laughs> all right, give me a beer afterwards. Um, but you, uh, so just to say this even more provocatively, even though it's being filmed, I do not believe that neural nets, just with huge amounts of data, will solve serious problems like machine language translation or dialogue, period, ever. All right? They will make useful artifacts that we can use for some simple purposes, but they won't. And it's going to be humans in the loop thinking about human sides of these things, including knowledge representation. Um, but, you know, it's been 40, 60 years of thinking about knowledge representation. It didn't lead that far that fast. So it takes time. It's hard. And it requires annotations. It requires what, why you annotate and what. Um, but, you know, don't read the media too much about all this stuff. This could take decades to do this field well. And for people thinking that, oh, well, five years has gone by, we don't have, you know, knowledge representation solving all the NLP problems, or, you know, it's just, that, that is such a hopelessly bad way to think. And with that, let's please uh, thank our speaker. Thank you.